It's really refreshing with Clint because he's never a kid in a candy store with visual effects. He's using it as a tool to reflect the movie making that he has always done. Without Michael's help and uh, without the help of the CGI houses that we've used, you wouldn't be able to recreate that tsunami. Clint likes to make his films almost like the way jazz musicians play their music. You know, they, uh, they have a whole lot of creative people come in and they come up with a whole lot of different ideas and you see what comes out of that process. And that's what happened with the tsunami sequence. We looked at all this live action footage from the real tsunami in 2004, which is pretty sad at some times. But all of this was like these mobile cameras. So everything was kind of blurry and, and our the task was really to match this characteristic with the only difference that it is now in full high definition. One of the key points for Michael was that it feel real, that it's not the big dramatic over the top adventure movie, that this is supposed to be a real heartfelt story and you're supposed to be immersed in it. What we're able to do on this film, I think, for the first time, is actually do water simulation on a grand scale. Water is particularly difficult to do. The resort shot where the where the tsunami first hits the resort is definitely one of the hardest shots, but also one of the most amazing shots. That's a 100% digital shot. So in that case, every person in there, the, the pool, the, all the little umbrellas, everything in there is completely artificial. The buildings are built log for log so we could destroy them any way we wanted. Even the little pool toys, we have tons of little toys sitting in the pool that get destroyed. There's lots of little details in there. Clint always shoots on practical locations whenever possible. Oh, I've done some in the ocean, I've done some in tanks. When we were in Hawaii, uh, Clint was like, let's get Maria and the little girl in the ocean. So uh, a lot of the footage above the water is in the uh, tsunami sequence was a lifesaver for us because the lighting in that particular environment was immediately believable. One of the really big challenges was the sheer amount of different situations of water that we had to integrate, partially uh, tank footage where the actress would have been shot in a tank with live action water. This tank facility is just amazing. We're shooting it all green screen, which is we're placing the background environment in completely in the digital world. The nicest thing about it, the water is 90 degrees. Maria, our actress, is interacting with the water that would carry her away and down the street. We've got underwater jets, we've got top surface jets. They're mainly like big fire hoses. If we angle them up, it's just creating a white water rapid. And then underwater is creating like an underwater current stream. So if we sort of pop the actress underneath one of those jets and then pop her up, all of a sudden she's carried by a jet and goes sweeping past the camera. She's underwater, she's on top of the water. It's complete chaos. It's amazing. We have a multi-million pound shoot with all the hundred years of cinema technology creating the waves. There's a guy with a barrel just pumping it up and down. The demands on the actors are absolutely huge. Cecile is fantastic. I mean, today she's been extremely brave and extremely patient. I mean, she's been in the water since 10 o'clock. She's had an hour's break. Um, and she's done very, very well. Excellent, guys. And we've cut. Very good. It's moving on. Especially in doing underwater filmmaking, you always face the issue of visibility, for example. In a live tsunami, you would for sure, once the camera goes underwater, probably see almost nothing because so much dirt and so much debris. But again, we're doing a film, so we kind of want to see something underwater. So Michael Owens actually came up with that idea that the tsunami wave is actually not just that big rush of dirty water, it's actually, you know, there's partially clear water coming in somewhere and partially dirty water from somewhere else. We looked at tons and tons of reference, and one of the things that kept standing out is a lot of these third world countries have just an enormous number of power poles everywhere. There's actually somebody, uh, if you look at under the balcony, there's somebody being electrocuted, and then there are people who get crushed by the cars. 
sometimes you get carried away a little bit and say, oh, that would be such a cool shot. Hey, let's have another car floating by. There were definitely moments uh, where I was like, oh, you really want to do that? Everybody in the, in the visual effect production team had to realize, you know what, Nelly, wait, wait a second. This is not about how cool the tsunami is. This is about the fear and the terror of, of a woman almost dying. Because it is a period where we are going out of the realistic tsunami into a, a process where she's being deprived of air and she's moving into the other side. Michael wanted to sort of have a, an aspect of that that was going into a very much a surreal environment. We called that the floaty bear sequence. I spent a lot of time underneath a swimming pool staring up at the uh, surface trying to figure out what that would look like. This was not a movie about the tsunami, because it's not a disaster movie. It's, it's about a private person having a near-death experience. I think this story offers an interesting opportunity, visually and storytelling-wise, to enter into that blur between now and, and hereafter. Thank you.